Hello and welcome to another edition of Miles to Go. I'm Miles O'Brien. Do you ever wonder who's responsible for all that hyper-partisan, sometimes outright false clickbait that streams through your Facebook newsfeed? I think a lot of us have the impression it's created somewhere in Macedonia by an entrepreneurial teenager, or maybe in St. Petersburg by one of Putin's stooges. That's true, it does come from there a little bit, but producer Cameron Hickey and I have been researching the subject of what we call junk news for 16 months now for the PBS NewsHour, and actually much more of it is homegrown. Before he came to work with me as a director of photography and a producer, back in the olden days, Cameron was in the world of software development. He was a coder, you know, one of those guys with a black screen and some green fonts. And so in the course of this investigation, he used those skills to good end. He wrote some software that searches the web, the social networks, looking for the origins of junk news. In the course of that, He found two sites that were virtually identical, except for the fact one was liberal and one was conservative. He did a little bit of sleuthing. He discovered the owner was the same person. And then one day, the conservative site stopped publishing political content, just out of the blue. Cameron was really curious at this point, and so he decided to reach out to the owner and figure out what was going on. He found out very quickly he had stumbled into one of the pioneers of this genre, shall we say. Now, we knew this would be an important interview to include in our series for the News Hour, so Cameron spent a lot of time cultivating this source, reeling in the fish, as it were, and the effort worked. And we got on a plane, not to Macedonia, not to Russia, but to Napa, California, and we had a fascinating visit with 26-year-old Cyrus Masumi. He's a young man with a natural gift for marketing, a love of politics, and frankly, a love of money, too. It's the perfect recipe for what you're about to hear. He is indeed a pioneer in the world of hyper-partisan news and misinformation, and what he told us was rather illuminating. I started a t-shirt website because I wanted to have an online business, which I could essentially make $10,000 a month off of. It would take only a few hours a week to manage and I could travel the world freely. I had lots of inventory and I had a lack of ways to market. I came across Facebook. I came across some conservative groups, which- at Wait, sorry, sorry, back up. You were in high school here in, in Napa? In Marin. Right? Okay, in Marin. And you were selling t-shirts to your fellow students? Is that what it was? Online, no, no, not in person. I never sold a shirt to anyone that I ever knew. Okay, I, I just want a few words on how you came into that business and how that- Well, I read Tim Ferriss's book, 4-Hour Workweek, which is about creating an online business, which is automated. So I created an online business, which was automated, where people could go to the website, they could buy a T-shirt, and everything was completed electronically from the production to the fulfillment. Okay, so you, you, you were a young entrepreneur, read this book, and you were gravitating to some way to, to make some money. Sure. Okay. What was it about the t-shirt business that lured you? Everybody wears t-shirts. So what was it about the t-shirts themselves that, that made them successful, and did you do well with it? I probably sold 10, 20,000 t-shirts. So the idea, you're in high school, people wear t-shirts, you, you read a book, you're inspired, you start telling t-shirts, and you, that, that's a pretty successful first foray for somebody in high school. Well, no, because the place that I sold them was on Facebook. I couldn't find anywhere to sell them. So I went on Facebook very early on in the Facebook days, and there were at that time um, some groups, some what we would now consider small Facebook groups for conservatives called like, you know, I am a conservative or being conservative that had a million or two million fans. And at that point in Facebook, nobody posted news links as you would now associate Facebook. And so I reached out to those page owners and I said, well, I have something that I can sell on your page and you can make money. And so once a week we would do postings and I would sell several hundred from those postings each week. Okay. So these t-shirts were, give us an idea of what they were anti-Obama t-shirts, like, uh, you know, gone with the Obama logo, or I was anti-Obama before it was cool. Whatever would appeal to a simple-minded person. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Uh, Well, you'd never catch me dead in a t-shirt with a logo on it, let alone a political one. Why not? Well, I have an IQ above 100. 
So, and you think dumb people do this? I think dumb people wear shirts with logos on them unless it's for ironic purposes. All right, so let's back up it then. You came to this wanting to make money or did you come to it with a political point of view or did it just kind of merge together there? Yeah, I hate Obama, but I also thought that t-shirts would be profitable. Which came first? I love the money since I was five, but I didn't hate Obama till I was 16. So all of this came together in high school. All of a sudden you're selling t-shirts. How did you get the idea to use Facebook as a platform for marketing your, your wares? Well, I had thousands of t-shirts in inventory and I had a website and I wasn't selling any because you have to have a marketing method. So I scoured the internet until I found this perfect place where there were, uh, you know, at that time, Facebook obviously was more of its infancy and I found these groups and they weren't doing anything. So it was like, you know, I could go to a website. I'll put it to you like this. Let's say that you go to a website where like a million people are reading it and you're like, hey, can I put my thing? They're gonna be like, I'm gonna charge you a thousand bucks a day, right? But if you go to a Facebook group where there was a million people and they're not posting news links, they're not selling products and you say, hey, you're not making any money. But if you post my links, I'll do a revenue share with you, money. You were way ahead of your time in this, weren't you, in some respects? Well, I was also probably debatably the first person to post political links on Facebook in a partisan manner, so. So there you are. Where did you get the idea? How did you get the idea? I wrote a newspaper which mocked my high school's newspaper. It got me suspended. When I was trying to get that financed because it's expensive to get a newspaper printed, I reached out to an existing conservative t-shirt website asking them if they would you know, put a page ad in my paper. And they said no. And I wrote my paper and I got suspended from my school and I was on like the front page of a few papers and I went on um, KGO 810, biggest radio station in California. It was very exciting. I learned that I loved media even more than I thought. Then, you know, after that, I was like, oh, like I reached out to that guy, like he has an online business. I've been reading this book about how to make a business online. His website's not great. He's an old school guy. I've got, you know, a bigger stack than him of skills. So I'm going to uh, take that on. What are the key things that you happened upon or saw or maybe some combination um, of that is that uh, political anger, uh, discontent actually sells doesn't it? Right. Well, I mean, how? of course. What is it about political anger that sells t-shirts? Well, political anger doesn't just sell t-shirts. The reason that people watch the news is to feel anger. You think anger is, is the big motivator here? Why do people watch ABC, CNN, CBS, anything? They watch it because they want to feel anger towards Trump because it makes them feel righteous in their hatred. Why do people watch Fox? Because they want to feel angry at the liberals. Anger, core human emotions, primal human emotions, that's what sells. That's what keeps people going through the commercials. So how much money did you make in the t-shirts? Do you remember? Not much, maybe like 100,000 or so. Well, know. for a high school kid, that's not bad. Well, for a high school kid with expensive tastes, it's not much. <laughs> you like the good things. Well, I thought that $10,000 a month would be enough until I started making $10,000 a month. I'm sure that you experienced the same thing. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. I don't know how I get by. It's tough. <laughs> the more you make, the more you want, right? Well, I'd blush if I saw your income. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how Sandy Hook got into the mix here. I got tired of working with other pages to sell T-shirts. And I said to myself, like, I could post news, and I can post news better than anybody at that time. And so there was Sandy Hook. And then there was a push to ban semi-automatic rifles, not assault rifles because assault rifles were already banned, but semi-automatic rifles. And this presented itself as the perfect moment to pick up cheap Facebook likes, cheap fans. And so I was able to purchase hundreds of thousands, millions of fans during that time of crisis, if you will, where conservatives, you know, if I put up an advertisement that said, do you stand against the assault weapons ban? Click like, and I was able to buy fans for a ridiculously low price. And so I've always felt subsequently in a reflection thereafter that I built my first business, sort of, if you want to call it, on the graves of young children who were killed. Well, how do you feel about that? I don't know how do people feel about things that they do badly. I feel bad about it, but I mean, we do what we do to pay the mortgage, right? Help me understand the order of business here. You went, you went from t-shirts to Sandy Hook, but when does Mr. Conservative come in the mix? Mr. Conservative was what I built with 
the fans that I bought from those Sandy Hook. So you're, you're selling the t-shirts, that business is going, and, and you see Sandy Hook happening. And what's the insight you had when Sandy Hook happened? What, what was there a moment of revelation to you when you saw? Well, it wasn't like Sandy Hook happened. It was like Sandy Hook happened, and then as usual, what liberals like to do is is that they follow the Saul Alinsky model, and they take every tragedy and they turn it into an opportunity. So they wanted to ban guns. So despite the fact that, for example, in the inner city, lots of blacks shoot one another and kill one another all the time, liberals don't care about blacks shooting one another. They care about a white person shooting a bunch of kids, right? Because it's all about the optics of TV. So the places like CNN, ABC, whatever, can sell those commercials. So they came after a gun that they shouldn't have because the AR-15 is not what's responsible for massive amounts of deaths. It's responsible for a certain type of death, which makes us feel very uneasy on our stomachs. It makes us feel uneasy when 20 white children are killed, but we don't care if 20 black children are killed throughout a city. So conservatives know this and we're very angry and it presented an opportunity in the weeks and months following where I could buy fans for a very cheap price. So like, am I guilty of committing a Holocaust? No, but there was a marketing opportunity because of the fact that liberals uh, are taking advantage of tragic situations and being a marketing man and a businessman, I saw that opening. And in hindsight, would I have preferred to start buying fans at a different juncture? Yes, but that was the opportunity. I want you to explain that for just a moment, how uh, you were able to uh, leverage an event in order to gain followers. To the, Was this to your Facebook page, your personal Facebook page? Mm -hmm. or? Well, no, a business page. And so what was this business? It was... So um, in this event, it would be called like the Mr. Conservative page. So um, essentially, like, let's say you go on Facebook and in the search bar, you type in PBS. And then you see, for example, that the PBS page has a million fans. Similarly, I made a page called Mr. Conservative. And what would happen is, is that at that time on the right hand side, there would be an advertisement and uh, gave you the text of the advertising that we used. If you stand against, you know, the assault weapons ban, click like. If somebody clicked like, they would become a fan of the Mr. Conservative page. Thereafter, uh, those would be people who would see my news stories. Okay. So that um, position that you took, that, that kind of very volatile, debatable point in, in American politics, lured people to your site, created likes for you, and Give us a sense of how successful it was. You went from how many fans to how many? Well, I very quickly had, I think, um, seven or 800,000 fans, which were making about 10 cents a month. So I was probably making 70 or $80,000 a month, like within, I don't know, half a year. So you went from how much income to that? Like negligible, like a few thousand a month, like 70 or 80,000. And really just based on, on one event and one subsequent ad, which got into the issue of... Well, I made a multitude of advertisements around the subject of gun control. And then subsequently, once I found that those advertisements were cheap, then I tried all other sorts of advertisements. In terms of the actual number, which I achieved strictly from the Sandy Hook advertisements, I would plot that somewhere around, like, let's say 500,000. But for example, Mr. Conservative has another million and a half fans on top of that. Mr. Conservative still exists, right? Correct. So you very quickly have a good steady income. The Tim Ferriss book uh, served you well. Well, it's not net profit, it's gross. You can quibble with me on that, but you're doing pretty well. Seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a month. Well, if you're spending $65,000 a month on advertising. Well, how much were you clearing? Uh, don't have my accounting in front of me. Well, give me a ballpark. Six figures, low six figures. Okay. Did you feel like you had hit on something uh, in particular when that ad on gun control appeared on Mr. Conservative? Yeah, it was a volatile issue. It's an issue which there is a segment of the population which feels strongly one way and strongly another way. You saw it, as, as you say, as, as a marketing opportunity, right? Correct. Did you care about the politics of it, or did you just see a chance to make money? By the politics of, of it, do you mean that I care about the politics of gun control? Yeah. I mean, I guess my question is, did you get in the fray? Did you make... Well, I felt very strongly that the liberal media was propagandizing the public uh, about the issue of guns. So did you have further content on your site which would 
further support that position? Was that the yeah, idea? Yeah, we had like many letters, for example, from law enforcement officials writing to the vice president saying that if federal officers, for example, entered their jurisdictions, that they would refuse to enforce any ban on assault weapons. And I actually thought, I thought that was very valiant of them. For example, now there's like a crazy guy on Fox News, Sheriff Clark. He was one of the original people who wrote a letter to uh, Vice President Biden saying that if any federal officers tried to uh, do it, then you know he would stand against it. So you get 700,000 people, you're, whatever you may be clearing, it's still a six-figure income. What happens next? Um, I start buying more fans. Then I probably made my way somewhere into the plus million range. I started doing consulting work for a multitude of different Republican organizations doing similar things. So can you give us an idea of the kinds of issues you exploited in trying to grow that audience? Yeah, my favorite one that I also feel absolutely awful about was the mosque at Ground Zero. I was consulted, and I don't want to name the organizations, but they were some of the largest ones in D.C., to uh, make marketing efforts against the mosque at Ground Zero. Tell me how you injected yourself into that. Sure. So the mosque at Ground Zero is basically an Islamic community center, which was going to be a few blocks away from where the 9-11 event happened. And I was contracted to, for example, create imagery and advertising campaigns, which would infer that, um, like, basically there would be some huge Islamic looking mosque with pillars, and, you know, like loud sirens to prayer and that there would be like towel heads running around it and that it would be like such a disgrace to the American ethic. And it was just, it's patently absurd. It was patent manipulation. It was patent neglect of the fact pattern. And it obviously endorsed bigotry. And I'm sure that it contributed to some vile comments, if not violent comments. You say that almost proudly. I'm sorry, did I? Yeah. I, I, actually, I said it was shame. Perhaps okay. I should work on my tonality. That was something that I was most ashamed of. I smiled at it because it's like, it's smiling because what else are you going to do but cry? So th let, me, let me ask you this. Who were you working for at that time? You, do, you said you were consulting or whatever, right? Uh, I was under non-disclosure agreements. Okay, but so I'm sorry, you were, but this is separate from your mis Mr. Conservative Correct. endeavors, right? These were for other companies. D how did the world kind of come to you after your success with Mr. Conservative? Yes, so basically what Tell happened. Tell me what happened there. So in the wake of Mr. Conservative, essentially what happened is, is that I was doing extremely successful with the number of fans that I had. So for example, like let's say I had a million fans on Mr. Conservative and let's say other people had like a million fans or two million fans, but they saw that I was getting 10, 20 times better results than everybody else. Or for example, there was tracking software, which would show like whose stories are most most viral right now. Like 80% of them were mine. Like I was the most viral across the board. Everybody was watching me and everybody was just waiting to copy me. And everybody who couldn't figure out how to copy me, which was pretty much everyone in the early days said, hey, can you consult for us? Can you work for us? Can you help build something for us? You're a pioneer. Mark Zuckerberg is a pioneer. I'm just a marketer. But you're the first to see this. Yeah. I mean, I'm a good marketer. Elon Musk's a pioneer. I, I would love to be a pioneer one day, but I'd say it's lofty for that. I don't know. All right. So your success is building. Take us to what happens next after the mosque event. Well, first of all, did that, that was a successful campaign, you would say? Yeah, I mean, it was very small work. I mean, compared to like how much gross revenue, you know, we were bringing in at the time. I helped build a number of other Mr. Conservatives. So like Mr. Conservative has 2 million fans, but like I probably, I couldn't even tell you the exact number of other Mr. Conservatives that I built. So like, let's say somebody's rich, somebody wants to have a conservative media outlet. Like there was basically like a consensus out there like, oh, like Cyrus can do this for cheap. Like Cyrus can make you like a big media presence on Facebook for cheap. And so I, you know, I charge my consulting fee, like I get equity split and then like, you know, I would get paid. Right. And then so, you know, Mr. Conservative was primarily starting to get traction in 2013. In 2014, for example, I was in D.C. working at a consulting shop over there, a really big consulting shop. And I was, again, you know, buying millions of fans throughout 2014 for other people. So you went to D.C. What did that do for your your, your the political component of all of this for you? Did it make you more? Uh, politically dialed in, or was it just another job? Well, I was astonished at how th these people, like for all the cynicism that I have about normal people and for all of the hatred that I have of like, I suppose, people's ignorance in things politics, it is astounding on both the Democrat, because I have done work for both Democrat and Republican collective organizations, like the larger ones, the ones that control like, let's say like bodies of governors or senators or congressionals. 
it is astounding, like just the animosity that they have towards their people, like just the sheepish way that a marketer will look because like, you know, we, we look and we know that like, if we move, if we change the number of amount of text on a page, or if we move like the graphics, you know, it's like that we influence your decisions. Like we influence how many people are going to put in their email. Like, oh, if we do a pop-up this way or a pop-up that way, like just, um, and then, you know, it's just, it becomes laughable, like the words that you use to appeal to people. And so I came into this game and I call it a game because I think most things in life are a game with love, just love, pure, pure love of politics. I still love politics, but uh, it was nearly stolen from me because these people, the people that actually like pull the levers, you know, on both sides, they don't care. For them, it's just like, it's a system, you know, it's a system of like, can we charge a political candidate like a million dollars? Like, can, so basically what they do is like, let's say like I buy Facebook fans cheap, right? The cheaper that I can buy a Facebook fan, the better. Now, let's say that you make a donation to a political campaign, you, right? Like to the Obama campaign, you donate 5,000 bucks. Well, he has consultants, which are paid a percentage of what they spend. So if I buy a fan for 10 cents and I'm just trying to make money and then they buy a fan for a dollar, but they get 20% of that. Well, they don't want to buy them for 10 cents and make two cents on the fan. They want to spend a dollar and make 20 cents. So it's a system built off of the swamp. Like Trump's talk of the swamp, well, obviously, you know, Trump's not my favorite guy in the universe per se, but th this is the swamp, right? I mean, when you think about people intentionally wasting money, like intentionally thinking that people on their side of the aisle are idiots, it can really take the romance out of your view of uh, politics. You have a healthy dose of cynicism, don't you? It would be difficult not to have a healthy dose of cynicism in uh, today's world, right? You say you work for Democrats. Tell me about that. It was more limited work where like they wanted to collect email addresses, so data mining. I created systems on Facebook where we could manipulate the, this was several years ago, this was not recent, but essentially I created what we would sort of call a native experience where users wouldn't have to migrate off of Facebook. So we were building applications where like you could donate money, you could give your email address, Anything that you can imagine that like, you know, you might do on like Obama's website or Trump's website. We did it so that we could do it on Facebook and then we would increase the conversion rate 400 percent, which is unheard of. Right. Like you bring in a consultant, he increases your rates like 20 percent. You're like, oh, you're awesome. You're saving me 20 percent. I was doing 400 percent increase of conversion rates. Explain what you mean by conversion rates. You know, you see a link like for Obama or Trump or whatever, and you click that link, it costs them, let's say, 25 cents. And then let's say out of 100 people, a conversion rate would be like, let's say there's a 10 percent conversion rate. That means they get 10 emails, for example. So instead of getting 10 emails, I was getting 40 emails out of every 100. So what was your secret? There is no facet of Facebook that I did not make drastic improvements on relative to my competition. I was making it an organic experience inside of Facebook so that you no longer had to travel to some unfamiliar website. Like there was the trust factor of Facebook and I was keeping you on Facebook. And then on top of that, I was just also like a much, much better like web. I had a better team of coders. I had better web designers. I have better aesthetic sense. There is nothing that DC consultants can do better than me. Like I school them all day long. It is embarrassing how much better I am than the DC people. So are they idiots or are you smart or both? Well, uh, both, but I mean, it's not much to call them <clears throat> idiots. Well, what is the secret though? I don't know, like what goes on in the brain of Elon Musk. I just, I see media different than other people. How? I look at it and I see everything that's wrong with it. It's just like, it's a fine tuned sense. Like, let's say that like you look at a shape and one person can tell you a hundred things that could be improved or that, that are wrong with that shape. And another person just looks at it and says, that's a rock. Well, I, I'm just much more in tune. When I look at media, I can just see a hundred things that are both wrong and that can be improved. While as another person just sees a screen with a Chiron and a person talking. How did you get this uh, insight in this talent, you think? Thousands of hours of watching and reading endless marketing books. So you've, you've taught yourself how to be a marketer. Yes, sir. Yeah. So when you were in DC, how old were you? 22. You're a young person, make a lot of money. I was at a firm of 50 people and I was the youngest person in the office and I was the second most powerful. And what was that like? Wondered why I wasn't the most powerful. <laughs> 
How did I know you're going to say that? All right. So what happened after? So D.C., did you, you you realized you did not want to be there? What happened after D.C.? So basically during D.C., I was making an incredible amount of money, an embarrassing amount. Seven figures? No. Close? Yeah. I developed drinking problems and girl problems and lifestyle problems like, you know, $10,000 suits and going to the club like two or three times a week and eating out 14 times a week and like a nice brand new high rise apartment. And so I ruined myself. And so then I had to uh, come back and recover, not like rehab recover, but like it was just it was eminently obvious that I was just like on the verge of bad things. And so I had to come get my bearings because basically, I mean, here's what happened. Like I was a young kid and I was just, I was looking to make it right. Like I originally had that dream of 10,000 bucks a month. And then all of a sudden, like I was thrown into this place where it's like, oh, you can make a half a million. It's not like I came from like some background where it was like, oh yes, like I am Theodore Cyrus the third and I will be an investment banker at Goldman and I will be making half a million by like my, you know, sixth year. No, it was like, I was a hustler and I never held a job before. Like I never flipped burgers. I never worked for anybody. It was like, I just did my own thing. I had like excellence at what I did and I just came into great success. A lot of success at a very young age. Recipe for disaster. So uh, at that point, did you think you'd want to do something else? Didn't you go to Austin? What, what happened there? I went to Houston. Houston. What happened in Houston? What was that all about? Uh, well, like I said, whenever there's somebody with money and they want to do a media website, I'll go out and I'll do it on a budget. So like that was like basically in the month or year leading up to the election. So I was working with a business partner and I think we bought 11 million Facebook fans that year. I, we actually spent more than the, the Russians did. So apparently the Russians spent 500,000 to a million. I think just on my Facebook accounts, like I spent over a million dollars on Facebook fans. Do you think we collectively spend too much time thinking about what the Russians might be doing? I think that the Democrats should spend 10 times more time talking about the Russians, because the more that you talk about the Russians, the more my guy is going to have a better chance of winning. And I love it when you guys talk about the Russians, because it's just, it's a bunch of talking heads in the media. And it's like, what does it mean anymore? Because do you guys stop and ask yourselves, like, what does the Russia story mean anymore? Because originally you thought like that there was going to be a secret meeting where Putin and Trump were like kissing one another. And then Putin goes like, Trump, here's the, the secret files. Like, here's the compromat. Oh, and I have the video of you. You know, I have the yellow tape. That's what you guys started at that. And then you've gone down and down and down and down. And now you're like, well, maybe like they hacked some information and like they emailed Don Fredo, obviously Don Jr. Fredo. And they were like, uh, hey, Fredo, like, do you want to see this content? Sure. Of course. Of course he wanted to see it. The same way that like Hillary hired Steele, spent millions of dollars getting that dossier, right? So if you actually look at like, who actually spent more money and got more resources from Russians. If you, as the mainstream media, actually reported this accurately, you'd find that it was the Democrats that actually received more benefit from Russian sources. But I say go for it. I say you're not spending nearly enough time. I say 10 times more time, because it's gonna make beating you guys in 2020 a hundred times easier. All right, we went off on a cul-de-sac. So you're, uh, you finally get back here. And what time frame are we in now when you get back here? April 16th. Okay. All right. So now you're back here. It's April of 16. You're trying to get yourself back on track. Suddenly the world is seeing Facebook and so-called fake news in a whole different light. Donald Trump is running. Did you see opportunity there? So in the run-up to the election, yes. I was buying conservative fans and I was making money off of those conservative fans in the run-up to the election. And then a couple months before the election, I also started buying liberal fans. Tell me about that. Hedging your bets? Well, yeah, hedging my bets. I saw a big opportunity there. So in that case, you took politics aside. It was just- Not really, because if you look at what I say, like if you actually look at the way that I parse my words, I love politics. So for example, Bill Maher is my childhood hero, okay? And Chapo Trap House, which is a socialist podcast, is my favorite podcast. And I watch MSNBC, and I actually don't really watch Fox News. So like, I love politics. I may have some views, but they really have nothing to do with what's negotiated between Republicans and Democrats. 
So you're political and yet nonpartisan. Is that what you describe yourself as? No, it's as? just that I'm too sophisticated to conform to party lines because the issues that the mainstream media presents to the public are fantasy issues. It's like, can you believe that nobody will stand for the national anthem? Don't worry about the fact that like we have like empire all across the world. Like, don't worry about you know a hundred other actual issues like worry about kneeling for the national anthem worry about you know some silly protest worry about like the the women's march how absurd is there more money to be made in tapping into the anger of conservatives than democrats well yeah because conservatives are angrier people tell me about that you ever seen a trump rally on tv yes yeah it's gold there, there's anger there yeah there is i mean there's a lot of angry cat ladies at a hillary rally but uh, there's a lot of dumb rednecks at a Trump rally. Thing about political rallies is, is that generally the only people who go to them are people who don't have anything to do. So you're just gonna find a lot of angry, bored people. But I will say that like, you look at like who listens to Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, like um, Levine, Stein in their car. I mean, basically this is entertainment for angry, fat white men in their pickup truck on the way to pick up lunch. So basically, the fundamental difference between conservatives and liberals is, is that conservatives trust the individual, but they have mistrust of the collective. Well, as liberals, it's the exact opposite, right? Like they don't trust the individual, but they have a trust for the collective. And this sort of manifests itself in different ways. So when you're a conservative and you think of yourself as an island, it's much more easy to have default primal emotions, which are like resentment, like, oh, I resent the collective. So it's when, you're, when you resent the collective, like then the base emotions that me as a media marketer should feed you primarily have to do with anger. I should be feeding you things which make you angry. While as for the liberals, like liberals like to fancy themselves intellectuals. Although really, what are they? Like pseudo intellectuals. So they want to feel self-righteous. So conservatives, like they want to feel like angry and like they're in on a scoop that the media just isn't savvy enough to get onto. And you know, the liberals, their own thing. Conservatives are the perfect audience for your style of marketing, you think? Oh, no. I mean, my liberal thing is just going gangbusters, right? I mean, great. So it works in both ways? Sort of. I mean, because basically, for all of the hatred that conservatives had of Obama, like tinfoil hat wearing Alex Jones, in my mind, Rachel Maddow is Alex Jones now. It's almost as if the pendulum is swung. I mean, I have never seen such frothing at the mouth from such unpleasant looking people. I mean, really, it's, it's almost amazing if you wear a pink hat and just froth how ugly you can look. What you're saying is the Democratic ire, the, the liberal ire, is now very profitable as well? Yes. Although it should be noted that these are small segments on each side. I'm convinced that probably only 10 million people in America are actually political. And by political, I mean probably like only listen to like an hour of like some commentator just dribbling on. Well, I, it's interesting you should say that because if you look at the audience of the cable news networks collectively, it's not a big number, actually. Their influence yeah. far exceeds the size of their audience, doesn't it? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I almost wonder, like, how does polling move? Because it's like people don't even know anything. Like, people really don't know. It's astounding how little. I mean, you, like, look at the people who are political and they don't really know anything. And then I wonder, like, the people who don't even watch this, right? Like just take away those 10 million who do even watch something. It reminds me of, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Cicero talking about bread and circuses. Give the people bread and circuses and they'll be satisfied, but they'll never ask for more, you know, give them their McDonald's, give them their NFL. And they'll never ask like, where is my privacy? Where is my freedom? Like, why, why do we have empire? You know, you got to wonder if, if uh, people actually took a proper civics lesson in school these days. Would anything we're talking about be happening? Strange that you mentioned civics. Liberals like to say that they're more educated than conservatives. Liberals have a higher level of standard education while as conservatives have higher civic knowledge. So that's interesting. So statistically, conservatives do have higher civics knowledge. Um, should 
there be more interest in politics? Not interest in politics necessarily. I'm just saying understanding of our system. What you're talking about is a fundamental ignorance of the whole system itself. People don't know their congressman is. They don't know they don't know who their senators yeah, are. Yeah, I don't they, know who my congressman is. You don't. You know, I actually thought it was hilarious when people were like, Johnson doesn't know where Aleppo is, because I was one of the only people that was like, you know, like, where is Aleppo? Because everybody else like I love, okay, so like on PBS or CNN or ABC, they went like, Gary Johnson didn't know that Aleppo, the capital, whatever, in Syria is, you know, like over there. They, so they give them the answer and then they're like, but Johnson didn't know it. But if they did it the other way around and they were like, all right, guys, like Jeopardy question, like where is Aleppo? And then like, dun, 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 dun. Let's, let's get back to April 16. You're back here. The election is heating up. Are you still running Mr. Conservative at that time? Are there other sites? In the run-up to the election, I was running both the conservative and the liberal side. Tell us about those. They were doing fantastic. Like, I was probably, coming up to the election, I was doing about $150,000 a month. Okay, but can you just back up? You, we were at Mr. Conservative. Now I'm going to talk about this. these new sites. What were they? Oh, so I built um, with a business partner, both a conservative business as partners. You know, he put up the money, I put up the, whatever you want to call it, skills. And then maybe like four to six months before the election, we started the liberal one too. What are they called? Well, he and I split, so I don't want to give the name of the conservative one, but the liberal one, which I, now that we've split, I own exclusively, is called Truth Examiner. And Truth Examiner is the third biggest liberal outlet on uh, Facebook. Did you see an opportunity when you saw Donald Trump running? I mean, I sort of did, but like, honestly, no logical person, like nobody really thought he was gonna win. Like, I mean, I try and pretend sometimes like, oh yeah, I thought he was gonna win. Nobody knew he was gonna win. I have one of my really good friends, she goes on Fox News. She was on TV that night saying like, oh, I always knew he was gonna win. Like every time I talked to her every week, she said, I, I, I don't think so. Did you think he would win? No, I prayed though, even though I'm an atheist. <laughs> you prayed that he would? Of course. Because? The easiest answer to this, and the one which I think people should pay attention to, I don't wear a Make America Great Again hat, and I'm not a dumb white redneck, but I am repulsed, repulsed by liberal culture. And I don't mean like, you know, uh, like normal people in the city, but I mean sort of like the professors at the colleges and like the social justice warriors. Trump, he's a conduit to wage culture war against my enemies. You have enemies. I view them as existential threats to my existence. Who? Professors on campus have basically promulgated the left with moral nihilism, which has uh, come about in, for example, in like hedonistic thinking, materialism, consumerism, the uh, social justice warriors, like the feminist professors, the social studies professors who would contend that men and women are biologically the same. They have such absurd beliefs. They believe that we are literally identical and that all of our differences are purely cultural. They believe that, you know, being transgender is not a mental illness. Well, it was a mental illness until like 10 years ago. And not only that, like, let's just forget about our disagreement with that. There are children as young as eight and 10 years old in Hollywood who are being given uh, drugs, which will uh, halt their hormonal development and it castrates them. And there are people who have stood up against this, like Owen Benjamin, and he was cast out for standing up against like a person who wanted to give their child a hormone blocker and it castrates them. Like if you don't think that there is a culture war, then you're not paying attention. And I am definitely a culture warrior and I would much rather go, if I was like going to be drafted for a war, I would much rather go to war with those people than like the Russians. I have nothing against the Russians. Like these are people who are burning my society to the ground. They're cultural Marxists. Aren't, aren't you perhaps giving them a little more credit than they might have as far as no, giving I, them the, 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 the status of an existential threat to us all? I mean, these are just viewpoints. First of all, they've decimated the First Amendment. Like my people, like Ben Shapiro, a Jew. So they call all of us Nazis, but Ben Shapiro, a Jew, can't speak at a campus. Forget about Milo, Ben Shapiro, Murray, IQ Curve guy, Suzanne Somers, like she can't speak. She was a feminist. She was a second wave feminist. She can't speak. So yeah, no, like you aren't my enemy, but you, in my mind, travel in the same circles as people who intellectually believe things like that, that like, that hate speech is violence, right? And that road erodes my first amendment, right? Like what else is there really? What else is there if there's no First Amendment right? And what else is there when we live in a society where 
also, I think that you probably travel in the same circles of people who are, if I said something online, I would never be able to get a job. If I said something that was politically incorrect, I would never be able to get a corporate job. Do you consider yourself politically incorrect? No, I consider myself correct, and I don't care what other people call it. When I say that men and women are not biologically the same, that was a scientific fact. Like, that was not disputed until gender studies professors started putting insane... So basically what they did is, is they created programs at college to steal money from people who are never going to get real jobs. Maybe, like, they'll get jobs working, like, at, like HuffPost, you know, working in the gender studies section. They're never going to get a real job, but it's a scam to get them into college, and then they're going to spread these insane views. Am I politically incorrect? I don't know. If I say that men and women aren't biologically the same, do you think I'm politically incorrect? Because, like, I just think it's science. Why don't you go talk to a biology professor? or he'll tell you that it's science. It's not politically incorrect. All right, in the run-up to the election, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of content. You, you created these two sites, one Democrat, one Republican. Did you, did you suspect the, the conservative site would do better? I think that they were about equal, like in the very run-up to the election. But I thought that after the election, obviously, like once we knew the results, the liberal one would be better. What was the content that was on these, these sites? Now, these are actual websites that you're driving people from Facebook to. Yeah. Explain how this works. I, 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 help us understand the business. Right. So, I mean, the Facebook model is, is that, like, you take breaking news and you put partisan spin on it and then you give it to people. It's not, like, original content. Like, it's, like, you take what is from a mainstream outlet and then you repurpose it to basically, like, exclude information which those people will not find favorable. And I'd like just to jump in there. So you might say, like, oh, well, then so are you misleading people? No, because if I don't exclude, then they call me like, oh, are you a Trump supporter? Like you put in that like Trump did something good. Like if I don't blame Trump for it raining, like the liberals are like, did you just not blame Trump for it raining? And I'm like, come on, man. Come on. Really? Really? Give us a couple of examples of how it works. You see a story. How does it work? You're watching a story and you see something that you see a wedge issue there. And what do you do? Let's say like news comes off the wire. And we see that there is like a partisan bent to, I'll give you a perfect example, like the kind of stories. So this actually comes into contradiction with what Facebook thinks Facebook should be and what Facebook is. Okay. Let's say that there's a huge important story, something which is like genuine news, like the tax here, here's a recent one. I know we're not going to air for a while, but Schumer and uh, McConnell reached a two year budget deal, big news. Okay. Trump was photographed walking up the uh, Air Force One flight of stairs, and it looked like he was holding his umbrella in a way so that Melania and Barron weren't covered, okay? The Melania and Barron one, super viral, okay, because people wanted to see those photos. Budget deal was like literally so irrelevant that we didn't even bother posting it because it just would never would have done well. And Zuckerberg not only wants the McConnell Schumer story, to actually be the one, but he wants it to be a thousand word version from New York Times. And meanwhile, people just want to like, look at like 10 images of like Donald looking like an idiot. So what's the lesson in all that? The lesson is, is that there should be a healthy ground. There should be a healthy mix. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, like Facebook has done a absolutely horrifically horrible job of telling publishers what they should be doing. Every time that they say, you know, do this, like we try it and it doesn't work, right? It's like if they put out like standards on Facebook and they're like, you know, like don't put fake information, right? Like that would be a basic one. But then like, like let's say they say um, make content more engaging. We've tailored it like 50 different ways based off of these recommendations. What they say never coincides with results. Do you create fake news? No, I, I don't. Tell me what it is then. So on Facebook, there is a news feed and the thing about a news feed is, is that only one story can be at the top, right? And then you've got other stories. So let's say that I, you went onto Facebook and you only liked Mr. Conservative. Well, then you would just see Mr. Conservative stories. But now what happens when you like Mr. Conservative, Fox News, The Blaze, Daily Caller, you like 10, and now everybody is covering the same story. Now you have 10 outlets competing to be in the, those top spaces covering the exact same stories. So suddenly everybody is twisting their headlines to make it from like, let's say very, very, you know, hard line like wire to like, let's say um, clickbait and then like hyperpartisan or like misleading, right? 
So then what happens is, is that like, then you have other people to jump in, like, let's say a marketing guy, not like me, but like a different kind of marketing guy. And he's like, you know what, like, I'm just going to hire one writer and I'm going to do my advertising. And then they have just that one writer. So they have one writer writing 12 stories a day. And now we have like 50 different places that you've liked one newsfeed. Okay. So then this writer like doesn't have time to fact check anything, right? In the case of like an outlet like that. And so then like they come across like a parody website, right? Like the onion, or there was like a whole thing that um, was found in a report where they found stories from places that looked like, like the real ABC news. Right. Mm -hmm. And so these fake stories, like sometimes get intentionally sent to like that one person. Right. And then that person's like, Oh my God, like that story sounds like it would go crazy viral. Right. Then they write it and they post it because they're writing 12 stories a day. Like they don't have time to fact check like those types of places. And then like sometimes that could even permeate the market because like, let's say the other people who also don't have time to fact check, or maybe there's two or three writers, but they're, they're looking at the software and they're like, oh, it's going crazy viral. We've got to get on that story. Like they don't go like, oh, like, can we like fact check it? Like maybe it just hasn't hit the wire yet. So then like they're putting it out there, right? So fake news is not in my mind something which is done maliciously. If you actually did like a forensic sourcing of it, you would find that like it started somewhere as like a parody or on some sketch website. And then some place where like a marketing guy had like too small of a staff got it and then somehow it permeated the marketplace. Now here's the important difference. Okay. Let's say that someone like me had my team and we accidentally posted something which the facts were not true. As soon as I realized that, I would delete it. The difference is, is that I have colleagues, if you want to call them that, people in the same marketplace as me, who if they posted a story, which was fake, and they saw that they were getting tons of traffic from it, what they would do is, is that they would let it run until they got all the traffic resources from it, all the money from it, and then they would delete it. Okay, so that's, that's the important distinction. It's a byproduct of the fact that Facebook is fundamentally flawed because there is too much competition. And out of that competition, everybody has too little staff. And as a result of that, that occasional fake thing is getting in there. So this would be, in your view then, a logical consequence of an attention-based economy, which is what Facebook is. Right. You know, we have this um, joke in the newsroom. We say sometimes, you know, there are some stories too good to check out. The CNN slogan? I'm just saying that we call it I'm a joke. Joking. It's a joke. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it sounds like um, that's uh, rampant. Yeah. I mean, you know, the upside is, is that like there's fewer of you guys. I mean, if there was like a hundred news stations like on cable, like I think that you guys would probably run into the stories the same way we do. You know, on conservative Twitter, we like to make fun of liberal outlets. Like we'll do like a story like Trump has conspiracy theory that like Trump Tower was wiretapped, right? And then they'll get like the headline from a month later and then they'll be like, you know, like, Trump Tower wiretapped. And it, what we do is we say like, life comes at you fast, right? And it's like, you guys never get called on it. Not you guys, but the, the mainstream media or like, you know, Russians hacked the voting booths. I believe that John Oliver ran with that. Turned out not to be true. There's actually a great number of Russia related stories which have been promulgated and then two weeks later have been walked back. Fake news is kind of a politically charged word and also implies like outright the wronghood. We, the term we've been using is junk news. I prefer that. Tell me why. Well, because um, the history of the word fake news, originally Craig Silverman created the term, John Oliver used it, and then Trump, because he's so good at branding, co-opted the term, and now it doesn't mean anything. So junk news. I mean, we need a new word. Does that describe it accurately, you think? I think that junk refers to quality, while his fake refers to the fact that the actual information is fake. So I'm uncomfortable perhaps having junk be the direct substitute because like maybe somebody like you, like an intellectual white collar guy would look at like what I do and say like that's junk news while is like my readers on Truth Examiner actually, if you look at our feedback is like overwhelmingly positive reception. Well, no, I think uh, you're, you're probably using a slightly different definition of junk than I am. I'm thinking more like spam. 
as opposed to oh. junk, meaning I'm not rating the quality one way or another. I'm just mm -hmm. thinking of it in a different context as opposed to, I, I want to see how the sausage is made a little bit. Uh -huh. you, you say you see a story, a picture with an umbrella or whatever it is. Give us, what, what is the, what's, what's the, the, the perfect story and, and how is it, and this is probably a pejorative word, manipulated or spun or presented? This is a very interesting question. In my mind, I sort of invented the, the rule book of how this is done. So in a previous interview, I said that I was the patient zero of fake news. And what I meant by that was not that I actually made fake news. I meant that I created a snowball, which when a hundred other people entered the market, you know, so basically it's like the concept of when too many people are competing, then you're gonna have like that happen. Now, the perfect story to answer your question. It appeals to the basic human emotions. So, I mean, right, like love, hate, anger, uh, kindness, like feeling good, feeling self-righteous. If a story is simple for our caveman mind. So again, going to back to the example, like the budget deal. Caveman mind is like, what? Like budget deal, right? But like umbrella, it's like, oh, anger, like Trump ogre, right? So the perfect story is simple for the uh, lizard brain in us. And then beyond that, so first of all, we need lizard brain story, okay? And then secondly, we need um, headline, right? Because results are contingent upon headline. So there is an art form to delivering a headline in a way where people want to click on it, but then simultaneously going along with Facebook's rules where they're like, don't leave information out of the headline, right? So like give, so it's like almost like this delicate tiptoe where it's like, okay, well they have to know what the story is about, right? We're not gonna like leave it out, but we also wanna make it so that they wanna click and read about it. And it's also a lizard brain. Um, and the image is like enticing, like it's like Trump looking like a goofball or whatever. So is it simply um, clever headline writing or is there more to it than that? Well, it's taking what comes off the wire. So a story, we write a story every hour from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it's basically every hour deciding which story in the last hour is going to appeal to those basic human emotions or like have the most novelty factor and then putting the best headline on it, using the best image for it. And then we have you know formulas for obviously how the content itself is done, which is a separate issue. So it's not like you know we're like searching through vast arrays of stories. It's like each hour there has to be a new decision, right? So I mean, there's not that many stories to choose from, right? I mean, there's like, let's say every hour, five stories. And then we're like, all right, that's, that's the lizard brain story. We're gonna you know give it a delicious headline that's not misleading. But then, of course, you know, I don't run the editorial. I have a, uh, an editor in chief, but it's very sad to me that then when it comes to the content, that we have to give people only the sides of the story that they find appealing. Well, tell me about that a little more. What do you mean? In other words, nobody clicks on it if you give them a balance piece. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, no, two facets. Yeah. So when I first entered the market and I was doing Mr. Conservative, I was competing against like, let's say Wall Street Journal. And they were just like writing like, you know, like the economy went up 2.5%, right? Like that was their headline. And like, there was like a picture of like the Fed. And then I would be like, Obama like destroys like the economy for another quarter, like see the graph, like, right? You know, like that was much more clicky than like what Wall Street Journal was doing. Clicky, I like that. And then when you got to the story, it couldn't be like, so in terms of what information am I going to include? Like, okay, so am I gonna put like, I'm gonna put every fact that's against Obama. But if I put like, but under Obama, like the food stamp rate has decreased 30% or like whatever, you know, just some something favorable. Then like the cold comments are gonna be like, oh, like, are you Mr. Liberal now? Like what's going on with you? Like I'm unliking this page. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, please die, please die. Like I hate, I hate you. Like please unlike my page. Like if you weren't making this. <laughs> yeah, I don't like them. What, you don't like your customers? No, I, I like, I'm sure that 50% of them are great people. But I think that if we could, yeah, just the other 50%, just find them an island. And believe it or not, that's about 50% of our conversation. I frankly was engrossed, while at the same time being a little repulsed. 
The bottom line, we kept talking, and I will share with you the rest of that in our next podcast. We're going to talk about the role of tribalism in our current fractured discourse. We'll talk about those quaint little old things we call facts and whether they matter anymore. And uh, we'll ask him if he thinks junk news actually tilted the presidential election in favor of Donald Trump. Oh, and one other thing. Why does he think conservatives are more angry than liberals? We sure would appreciate it if you would take a few moments to rate this or any of the other podcasts you've listened to in this series. And if you have a few moments, jotting a few lines for a review would also be appreciated. Head over to milesbryan.com anytime you like. You'll see what we're up to. We've got daily updates on the world of science and technology. And you'll know what we're doing in the world of television as well. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter and you'll never miss a thing. Thanks for listening to Miles to Go.